really quick, I was just digging through some old files and I found a clip I did on television right after my book and the Chrysler Turbine Car came out, Channel 2 in Detroit. I completely forgot I had this. I don't think I posted it before, uh, but once in a while people ask me and they think these things are funny where I was on TV talking about my books and I remember getting up really early in the morning and driving into the Channel 2 studios in Detroit and uh, the place is a ghost town showing up but uh, I, I go inside and somebody meets me and they bring me back, put me in the studio and I, I got to do this interview which is very, very cool and, and the interviewer is a very, very nice guy and then as I was leaving the producer actually said, hang on a second, I can get you a copy of the interview and I hadn't even asked for it. So he walked out a few minutes later and he gave me a, a, a disc and then uh, later on I must have transferred it to uh, a portable hard drive and I found the portable hard drive yesterday and I was digging through it and I found this. So just a couple minutes long, but it's a blast from the past. Me talking about the Chrysler Turbine Car book that I had just published. Hope you enjoy. Bye-bye. Well, it was a time when Lyndon B. Johnson was president. The Beatles had just released their album in the U.S. and Chrysler put a jet engine under the hood of the car. In his new book, Steve Leto pays tribute to Chrysler's turbine car, a book forwarded by Jay Leno. And Steve joins us in the studio. Thank you so much for being here. It's good to be here. Now, here's the interesting thing. You have to tell me why. They put a jet engine in a car. Right. Apparently, it worked. It could run on any type of fuel. Yep. Lasted for three years, then they go, uh... Ah. Why did they quit? Well, a couple things happened all at the same time, and it was bad timing. But smog happened, and the EPA came out with new tailpipe emissions in the 1970s. Um, they had problems with OPEC and the oil embargo, and, and, and um, they started talking about CAFE standards. The, the government said that car companies had to put out cars with better gas mileage. All of that happened right around the time that Chrysler had its first financial troubles. Uh. And so they had a choice. Do we pool all our resources and make the turbine car fit the new government guidelines, or do we go back and work with the piston technology? And so they had to make a call and they went with the pistons. You know, you look down the road now, how different would things have been if they had stayed with this program? And they would have sounded different, too. So you could drive this thing on alcohol, kerosene, diesel, Chanel number no. five. <laughs> I know women out there right now are groaning, you, you want to burn that? But the point is, it would run on anything. And so you wouldn't have to be using petroleum based fuels. Things could have been very different, but yeah. it didn't happen. From a cost perspective on the production line, was it cheaper to make? No, it was a little more expensive to make, right. and that was one of the problems. But if they had gone into mass production, they could have brought the price down, and that's where they killed the program, before they went into mass production. Now, this was delivered to a bunch of people who actually drove it around for a number of years. Did they like it? They loved it. And see, that's the thing. Chrysler, Chrysler was very good at public relations, and yeah. they pulled a publicity stunt, and they loaned out these cars to just average Americans. You could drive a jet car for three months for free. And overwhelmingly, people loved the cars. Everywhere they went, they drew a crowd. The cars were easy to run. They, you know, they fired up immediately. They didn't need oil changes. They had all wow. kinds of advantages. And then at the end of the program, they rounded them up and destroyed them, just like the EV1 electric car. So you couldn't even buy it at that point in time if you wanted to. You couldn't, and people wanted to. Yeah. They got people who, who called them up and said, I'll pay you any price for one. And they said, no, it's, unfortunately, they're not for sale. Absolutely amazing. Now, how did you research this book? How did you talk about, who did you go back and talk to? And how, was it difficult to find these people? Well, you know, because this is southeastern Michigan, I tracked down a lot of these engineers who worked in the program are still around. Many of them are retired, but mm -hmm. they are around. And a lot of them love talking about this. To them, this is the highlight of their careers. Imagine that you spent your years, you know, designing cars, and you got to spend a few years working on jet engines in cars. Yeah. And a lot of them would be, oh, I'll tell you everything I know, plus I'll hook you up with the guys that know more than I do. And so I tracked down quite a few mm -hmm. of these guys, and I got it straight from the guys who worked on the program. And it was really an amazing program. Fantastic. Well, we've got a great write-up in the Wall Street Journal, and you're going to be appearing tomorrow in, somewhere in Royal Oak, right? Royal Oak Public Library. All right, from 1.30 to 4.30. Much continued success. It sounds like a fascinating book. Thank you very much. All right, and, uh, you know, you just see the passion here, Ben. <laughs> but he has passion for this, much like you have passion for a beautiful weekend. Yeah, I, and it keeps me on the right side of things, too, with that game